Hello everyone, today we'll be taking a look at the MIT Integration B2024 qualifying round, which consists of 20 problems to be solved in 20 minutes. This video will cover the first 10 questions, which are relatively simple but nonetheless interesting to quickly go through, and then we'll cover the next 10 problems in the next video. Without further ado, let's take a look at these 10 problems. Now, problem 1, well, as you probably realize by looking at the problem, it's really straightforward, so I will reserve my time for the other more interesting problems and leave this problem in your good hands. Okay, let's take a look at problem 2 over here. Frankly, it's actually not too difficult as well. If you look at this uh, expression, it has powers that are really weird, so it's really intuitive for you to take logs and see what uh, comes out of it. So if you were to take the log of the top expression, what will you get? Well, you bring down the power and you get log x plus 1 and then you times log x minus 1. So this is what you get if you take the log of uh, the top. Now if you take the log of the bottom, what do you get? Well, you bring down the power and then you times log x plus 1. So what you realize that if you take the log of the top and you take the log of the bottom, you get the same expression. So the top and bottom are actually the same. So this tells us that this whole expression over here is actually 1. So what you are interested is the integral of 1 and so the answer is just x. So not too difficult, it's a good warm-up first two problems. We are off to a good start. Let's take a look at problem 3 which uh, is where you really start to need to use some integration techniques. But again, it's not too difficult because, well, you do know how to integrate 2x. And integrating x log x, the fairly standard trick is to just use integration by parts. So let's see how this plays out. So if you integrate, uh, just do the x log x part for now. What you have is integration by parts where I will integrate this and then differentiate this later. So I have half x squared log x and then minus half x squared and I differentiate log x I get 1 over x and so just writing the first part over again and then I integrate half x dx and integrating half x well that's re relatively straightforward is a quarter x squared so now uh, I have the integral of the first part. Now integrating 2x obviously gives you x squared. So if I combine the results, I will finally get the answer is just half x squared log x and then plus 3 quarter x squared. So not too difficult for problem 3. Uh, again, we are off to a good start. Let's go to problem 4. So problem 4 is really cute because if you look at problem 3, it's actually integral x log x plus 2x and now the x log x plus 2x is in the denominator. So this is actually a nice red herring. You might think there's something to do with problem 3 and so on. And then you'll waste a lot of time wondering what it's supposed to do, thinking of whether there's trick formulas, or not trick formulas, but integration formulas that deals with x log x in the denominator and so on. But actually the really, uh, the really, crafty thing is if you have noticed that there's an x and you pull the x to the top as 1 over x and you write the bottom as just log x plus 2 now do you see how to solve this integral it's actually quite straightforward because if you differentiate the denominator you get the numerator so this means that the answer is just the log of the denominator so a really simple and short solution to problem 4. So we are off to really a lot of time savings for the first few problems. Now problem 5 is where we have a problem that we need to reason quite deeply for the first time. So let's take a look at this problem. If you look at up cost of sine, there really isn't really an um, integration formula to help deal with this. And there's no trick formula that really helps you out. So what you really want to do is think about the graph of this function and given that it's a definite integral, maybe you'll be able to uh, use this to find the area of the curve, under the curve and get the answer, right? So to do that, I'm going to just recall for you how the function sign looks like. It looks like this. 
uh, this is sine 0 pi 2 pi and then how does the function cosine looks like I'm going to just draw from um, 0 to pi because uh, I will only be using that for up cos okay then now over here I'll be drawing my function up cos of sine x okay how do we reason about this well it's not too difficult if you think about what happens at the start you start at zero right uh let's start from x equals zero and see what happens well sine x is zero and so uh the arc cosine of that is pi over two so you start off at this point pi over two okay and then let's increase to pi over two so i go at pi over two pi three pi over two two pi and see what happens okay so when i increase from zero to pi over two my function sine x increases to one so my cosine my arc cosine goes uh, backwards to zero so essentially i come down from pi over two to zero i the exact shape of the curve does not matter just know that there's some shape okay and then now if we go from pi over two to pi my sine function comes back down so my cosine function goes back to pi over two in a way that's symmetric symmetrical to how uh it came down initially and then from pi over two to three pi over two what happens now i move to minus one sine of three pi over two is minus one so my arc cosine goes from pi over two to pi and the shape of this is basically uh the rotation of the previous curve so there's some shape here and this is just the rotational version of it and and then lastly from 3 power 2 to 2 pi i'm going to move uh, backwards so again this comes down back to pi over 2 in a way that is symmetrical to before however the word symmetrical is but basically now i need to find the area under this curve and by the various hand wavy symmetry thing that i talked about what i mean by that is if we draw a rectangle this area is actually going to be equal to this area so the area under the red curve is simply given by the area of the orange rectangle which is pi over 2 times 2 pi which is just pi square so I hope you enjoyed this interesting little problem 5. Uh, yeah, there's really uh, no deep integration techniques involved, but pure reasoning about how the function behaves. So let's take a look at now at problem 6. So problem 6 is a trick problem. Now, you might initially think that maybe the numerator is related to the denominator through some derivative or integration and so on, but you soon realize that well the terms don't really match up very nicely so you want to first maybe do some trick uh simplification like use some trick identities and so on but again actually you don't need to use very deep uh trigonometry identity for this you can simply try and first rewrite the top and the bottom in terms of sine and cosine so if we rewrite the top expression in terms of sine and cosine what we have is the top is cosine x plus cosine x over sine x plus 1 over sine x plus 1 which you can actually factorize as cosine x plus 1 times 1 over sine x plus 1 not a bad start not a bad start how about the bottom so for the bottom we can similarly if we write everything in terms of sine and cosine you know, sine x plus sine x over cosine x plus 1 over cosine x plus 1 which again you can factorize as sine x plus 1 1 over cosine x plus 1 now you really want to make the top and bottom somehow related to each other or cancel each other and this is where you realize that well 
for this term, you can take out 1 over sine x and then what do you get? So let's see, this is 1 over sine x, then you have 1 plus sine x. Very nice, you have something in the, in the uh, bottom expression and similarly, if you take out 1 over cosine x, then you have 1 plus cosine x here. Very nice. So if you take the top, divide by the bottom, then the cosine x plus 1 cancels, the sine x plus 1 cancels, and all you are left with is uh, cos x over sine x, which is cotangent x. So this whole expression here is simply cotangent x. So what you are interested in is the integral of cotangent x dx. And the integral of cotangent x, there's a standard formula for it. In case you are not familiar, it's the log of sine x. So that's all there is to problem 6. Uh, for once, I feel that we actually did a bit of algebraic manipulation and that feels good. Now, let's take a look at problem 7. So problem 7 is quite straightforward. Essentially, you realize that you can uh, write this as a to the 4 minus 1 over a minus 1, where a is x to the 5, 0, 6. And here, it's just a cubed plus a squared plus a plus 1. So you can just uh, use this to get uh, simplify the integral into the integral of some polynomial which I'll leave you to evaluate and finish up the problem. There's nothing too deep over here. So let's move on to the next problem, which again, I'm frankly not sure if there's a really fast way to compute this, but I thought since the power is just 2, you can simply expand this and work out the definite integral really, really quickly. It doesn't take very long. It's only, you expand this, it's only three terms. Uh, definite integral is really fast to evaluate, and I'll leave you to work out this problem as well. So let's take a look at problem 9, which is back to uh, another of the less straightforward but uh, still relatively manageable problem. So over here, uh, we need to find integral of sine x plus cosine x to the power of 11. So the power is quite big, so surely you don't want to do some expansion. You want to simplify this into just one trick term. So you might be familiar with formulas for things like sine x plus sine y or cos x plus cos y, uh, they are called the sum to product formulas. But maybe you're not familiar with a formula for uh, sine x plus cos x. So there is indeed a formula that goes along the lines of a uh, sine x plus b cos x is actually the square root of a square plus b square sine x plus theta, where theta is up tangent of b over a or something like that which you don't need to memorize because you just need to know this general form and then you apply the expansion formula for uh, this and you can compare terms and figure out what theta is in terms of a and b. So uh, by doing this uh, comparison, you realize that sine x plus cos x can actually be written as square root 2 sine of x plus pi over 4. So now we need to take the integral of this thing to the power of 11, but the really nice thing to realize is that 0 to 2 pi covers a full cycle of sine, and if you shift by pi over 4, you will still cover the full cycle. 11 is an odd power, so if you take the power of 11, the positive and negative parts remain symmetrical to each other, so the positive and negative area cancel each other, and this whole integral is just zero. So a very cute little problem where you could potentially waste a lot of time if you don't use the right observations. But with the right observations, this problem, again, is a massive time saver. So now let us take a look at problem 10, which is very cute because problem 9 is sine x plus cosine x to the power 11, and problem 10 is hyperbolic sine x plus hyperbolic cosine x to the power 11, but uh, there's again no relation to problem 9. So the way to do this is you simply use the formula for hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. It's quite straightforward. Hyperbolic sine and 
uh, hyperbolic cosine. Uh, one of them is this, the other one is this. Uh, and basically, if you take the sum, you're just going to get e to the x. So, uh, if you take uh, e, to pack, e to the power x to the power 11, what you are after is the integral from 0 to 2 pi e to the 11x dx. And I'm sure you'll be able to work this out, so I'll leave this problem again in your good hands. So what do you think of first-hand problems? Actually, frankly, a lot of them are really uh, quite straightforward. So do stay tuned for the next 10 problems, which is where the fun really begins. Do subscribe to the channel for more math videos, and see you soon.